Okay, we're talking about the wonderful um, uh, deluxe edition of Season's End, which actually comes out on the 19th of May, and I will put a purchasing link just below this video. Um, I thank you, Pete, for doing this interview. My first question, actually, is uh, I'm intrigued in terms of when it, when it came to auditioning vocalists at this time. Uh, apparently, Stu Nicholson from Galahad auditioned, but he was too much like Fish. But you... Uh, you also had Carl Sentence, who's uh, got a wonderful voice. What was it about his voice that uh, just wasn't quite right for the band, do you think? Um, specifically, <laughs> I can't remember. But... Um, He's a very rock vocalist, isn't he? Maybe that was yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it might have been that, you know. We, we weren't sure. It's one of those things that is really annoying, um, but you find it a lot with bands, is... Not you don't know what you want, but you know what you don't want. You right. know we're sort of, and we were searching for something just a little bit different, and we didn't want to. Yeah, we didn't want to go down the rock thing. Yeah, we didn't want to have. We didn't want to go down the fish type vocalist either. So we probably didn't want anyone too flamboyant. What we wanted was just somebody who, with, with talent and enthusiasm, and who, who, um, who would just fit in well. And um, eventually, well, eventually we found Steve, and yeah. we thought he'd be really good, and he didn't. So we kind of had to persuade him. Yeah. Um, it took a bit of persuading. Yeah, yeah. And we cajoled one or two friends of his as well to sort of have a word in his ear and say, you know what, you really ought to do this. You know, this is yeah. the thing you should be doing. Yeah, that guy from Curved Air, wasn't it? The violinist. Yes, Daryl Way. Yeah, well, Daryl Way was a very good old. Daryl Way was um, very good friends with Ian as well. Ian was in his band, Daryl Way's Wolf, yeah, which yeah. happened to be the first band I ever saw. Well, technically, the second band I ever saw live. The first band being their support band when I saw them at, at Friars Aylesbury, mm -hmm. which was Lee Olme. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and and then uh, Daryl Way was second, and Ian was on drums. He probably I would have been about I don't know sixteen. He would have been Ian would have been about eighteen at the time, I guess, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit younger. Okay, I can't remember if I was fifteen or sixteen. So you you know with uh, um, uh, Carl. So consequently. Carl yeah, we had a lot of people and we had, a, you know, we had a lot of tapes to sift through. And then we had a lot of people who kind of skipped that process and, um, and, and came along. There was a guy from Ireland as well, from a band who was a, a, a big favourite with the record company. Right. But again, you know, we, we just, we just, we weren't, we, we yeah, it, as I said, we didn't know what we, we didn't know what we wanted, but we definitely knew what we didn't want. Well, I mean, I, I, I read that you uh, um, approached uh, Viv Stanshaw from the Bonzo Dog Doodah band as a lyricist or singer. I don't know if that's yeah. true or not. And could you see Marillion including I'm the Urban Spaceman in their set? Well, probably not. No, no, I think it was more lyricist. What we did think, um, you know, we, we, we felt that to fill all of the shoes that, that Fish um, had left um, it was going to be a tall order. Yeah. You know, somebody who was, you know, a good front man, a really good singer and a great lyricist as well, which Fish was and still is. Um, yeah, yeah. We thought, well, you know, that's going to be a tall order. We might not find somebody who can do all of those things. So we did look around at lyricists and Viv Sanchez of course you know famous for lots of things yeah yeah there's absolutely. a couple of other people as well um and um and we ended we we we, we fell upon john helmer who, who wrote a few lyrics yeah and it, it was one or two of his lyrics that um when steve ev eventually um, auditioned yeah he um he 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 sort of we said, well, we'll play a bit of music and here's some lyrics and maybe you could, you know, try well, and it, it, see it, what you do over them. And, and it was quite a nice, quite a nice little way to do it, really. 
I mean, King of Sunset Town has been described as a kind of a rebirth or, of this band, the way it emerges on the album. But I'm interested yeah. how much of that song is John Helmer and how much of it is Steve, is Steve Hogarth. Oh, you're asking the wrong person there. Because <laughs> I, I think Steve might have ended, uh, added the uh, bit at the end. I think Steve you? probably added to it, yeah. Oh. I mean, John was really good about that. That's one of the cool things about that partnership at that time was that John wasn't really... Pre I mean, John himself actually came down to audition because he was in a band. He'd been right. in a couple of bands. In fact, he'd been a, on top of the pops with his band. Okay. And... Um, and so he came down um but he was a bit too he was a bit too indian alternative really for you yeah. know again um wrong but in a very different way very 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 left field kind of way you didn't want to be kind of xtc you didn't want um what's it uh carl sentence because that would make you a bit like bad company maybe and you didn't want to be like the old Marillion, so you had quite a yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a fine, it's a fine line, as they say. Yeah. So um, really, Steve fit the bill great, actually, because we just wanted him to be himself. And I think that was the main thing. We didn't want someone who was a thing. We just wanted someone who was themselves but could sing well. Yeah, absolutely. You know? absolutely. And we we were looking to change ourselves. You know, we were we didn't want to carry on. You know, because the the, the the choice is really when 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 you're you know when when you're in that kind of position the choices are you move forward and move move somewhere new yeah. and exciting yeah. or you become a parody of yourselves you know absolutely. if you're not careful absolutely you know? yeah. and um, and so we knew you know we knew we we were talented we were we were the musical writers anyway so yeah, yeah. we knew we had the music we just needed to we need we just needed the rest of the um, the equation really i mean speaking of the music i mean uh, story from a thin wall shadows on the barley tic-tac-toe beaujolais day these were these musical ideas that you had from the um clutch, clutching at straw sessions that were brought over were there any lyrics to yeah. these things at the time there were yeah officially fish fish used the lyrics he uh, used the uh, lyrics in, in a his few vigil places and, and we we used the music and uh, that worked quite well we thought that worked quite well uh, um yeah. yeah and you know um so i we we used to rehearse at that point in time we rehearsed in my garage i had a big double garage right at the time and um there were some you know there were some 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 bits and pieces because we boarded up the sides to try and um try and contain the noise yeah um uh, and um Fish used to write sort of little ideas and, you know, little um, uh, titles and things on the walls. Yeah. On one one part of the wall. Um, so there was a few things there that um, he probably took away. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but musically, um, we kept some bits uh, and some bits just got changed as they evolved into, into, parts of season's end and beyond i think we used a couple of bits in um, in the second album with steve as well but um, but the first album was um a lot of that kind of material and we carried on working on it actually after fish left as well while we were kicking our heels because we were wet we were looking for a singer for a long time yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have said about that. Bit. They said, "Well, didn't didn't you ever think, you know, this might not work?" And uh, mm. but the fact is, we didn't. You know, we knew, we knew what we had, and we. I think we just felt, yeah, we felt very positive about yeah. what would happen when, you know, when we got it right. Yeah, and that's the impression. So it was, yeah. it was, it was worth the wait. And, yeah. Um, yeah i'm um, interesting he mostly said that uh clutching at straws exposed the decaying tethers that held the band together what was your worst memory uh, for you personally during that time because that whole split must have been quite ugly for you all really yeah it was yeah of course it was yeah i mean the tour the tour was the most bizarre thing about that whole episode because you know we'd written we'd written an album I mean, the thing about clutching at straws is that uh, 
We'd originally written an album, which wasn't that far away from Clutching That Straws, that had been kind of um, declined. Chris Kimsey had sort of declined to work on it. He said, no, that go, go away and do something better, basically. Okay. So we reworked it um, and got it to a stage where he was happier with it. We were, I guess we were happier with it. Mm -hmm. The, uh, I mean, the record there was a, there was a lot of pressure from the record company to, to, to. to I mean, musically, it's great. Musically, yeah. I think I think it really works well. A lot of it, um, and then it was sort of it was almost a given that it would be a number one album. Everybody yeah. was saying, every even before they heard a note, everyone was saying it was a num it was going to be a number one album. So we kind of felt like, you know. I don't know. It's a strange thing when you get that kind of praise and then it happens. It's like, well, who exactly made it a number one album then? Was it us or was it just EMI spending a lot of money, you know? Uh -huh. So that's how. That, and then we went on this huge sellout tour. And um, and I was just miserable. It was a it was a miserable time. to. It should have been. The, you know, we should have been, you know. We should have been really, really happy. We should have, you know, we should, we were kind of, we'd, you would think we'd reached our holy grail, but it really wasn't. It was just, it was just a strange experience. We had security guards. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't go anywhere. The crowds were so big. You just, you know, you couldn't get anywhere near a stadium. You couldn't, you couldn't walk to a show. Yeah. yeah. You couldn't walk around a show. You couldn't see any of your guests. It was just like we were just herded between nice hotels and and dressing rooms and yeah. airplanes and airports and it yeah it was no fun at all and did all that contribute to the and it was a lot of strain as well because these play oh. a lot of these shows were so huge and we couldn't hear ourselves half yeah. the time i mean we had massive amounts of pa and fish had fish had sort of thousands of watts of flown pa just so that he could try and hear his voice. But the crowds were loud. The crowds were so loud, you know. Yeah. You just, even then, it was a struggle to hear anything. Yeah. And I was so far away from the drums, I could hardly hear what Ian was playing. Yeah. And did all that contribute to the... Everything, the yeah. The whole thing in... contributed. It was just, a, it was very, compared to the, um, compared to the tour before for Miss, Misplaced, it was, it was, it was a shame, really. Yeah, I was just pleased when it was all over. <laughs> How important was it for you to get uh, for Marillion to get their album out before Fish put out Vigil? Was that a, a source of tension for you? Oh, I don't think that was a source of tension. I think what was a source of tension was trying trying to get a record out in the first place, trying to be signed because we didn't EMI didn't want to sign us. They yeah. were like, "Oh well, we'll have to hear anything you do." Then they got excited because we had Steve Hogarth and they realised that we had a good singer. Yeah. And they sort of, they they realised that, oh, wait a minute, he sounds a little bit commercial to us. Yeah. And uh, so they were kind of, in the back of their minds, I think they were thinking, oh, this, you know, we could we could turn this into a mic and a mechanics if we, if we uh, you know, do it the right way. So they tried to do that a bit. Well, Not on the first album. The commercial. first album, we just went away and we wrote it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a great time to be writing. It was yeah. a great time for the band. There was a massive amount of enthusiasm. Once Steve was on board with it, and uh, and we started kind of looking at what we could do with our music and, and, and what he could contribute of his own as well, because he had songs. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of the songs we heard was Easter. Oh yeah, yeah, that was one. The first half, part, part, half of Easter, and a couple of others. Games in Germany, and one or two other. I think I don't think we heard Dry Land then, but there was a, there was a there was a couple of things that he there was a few songs he had that because um, obviously he'd come from the Europeans and then how we live. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He was I mean, a, what... part of a songwriting team anyway. So yeah. and it was very exciting putting the, this album together, Seasons End, and then we uh... we had to. You know, we told EMI we had an album and we had to demo it for them, so we did. 
we did that at um, we were sort of writing and demoing a, a place called the Mushroom Farm, yeah, which yeah. was which was near Brighton. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Doing some writing down in Brighton, so um, <laughs> so that was fun. Yeah, and well, um, and they liked what they heard, so yeah, we finally they finally got on board with 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 letting us record. Good. Uh, Bob Ezrin apparently came into the sessions. Was it the Clutching at Straw sessions or the Season's End sessions? He Did came into the. Anything? He, he came in. Uh, uh, yeah, he came, We went to a strange little studio in a place called Nettlebed, right. which is on the way between. It's kind of near between Oxford and Henley, I guess. Nettlebed is. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, not far from my neck of the woods. I'm from Reading originally. Oh, there you are. Then, well, if you take the back road from from Reading uh -huh. towards Aylesbury or towards the, the the Henley Road, you end up at Nettlebed. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, and he 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 came down for a day, and um, I mean, what a history he's got. Yeah. I I loved him anyway, even before yeah. the Floyd stuff. I loved him because of the Alice Cooper stuff he did. Yeah, kiss the you know, billion out, dollar babies, the schools out, and all of that stuff. So yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, Ezrin. and he was um, he wasn't very impressed with us. Well, I've read quite a few things that Bob's quite challenging to work with. He worked with Kiss, and, and they said he they said he had them jumping about to whistles and things like that. And uh, yeah, he's. A, I mean, the only thing he really got excited about was a strange noise that happened in the studio. There was this really weird noise, a kind of out of phasey thing that yeah. started a feedback loop. And he was like, what's that? What's that? We, we need to record that. And it's like, well, um, why can't you be more enthusiastic like that about the music you're hearing then? You know, because he, he was like, um, yeah, I don't think he really knew. I don't think he wanted to get into what he would want to do right to right. our music and i think he probably realized that we wouldn't want that either yeah. so i think he decided to gracefully stay away but well, one fan because, you know i'd have loved to you know as a as a person to work with i'm sure he's got there's so much experience he could have passed Absolutely. on to us but it wasn't I mean, to be yeah i mean one fan uh, roger taylor apparently really liked hooks in you and i'm I'm just wondering, yeah. in the context of this album, do you feel that Hooks in You is a little bit out of place? And did you have incommunicado in your mind while you were writing this one? Oh, no. I don't think we had incommunicado in our minds. No, we, I don't think we had any of that music in our minds, actually. Um, but, um, but Steve had this riff. Yeah. And it was like, oh, that's great. And, and, um, and I think Steve Hogarth kind of, quite liked what it was doing it was a little bit it was a bit hey van halen and it was yeah. a little bit kind of um living color as well that kind of stuff and you know so we were they didn't quite get where yeah it didn't quite do i mean it was it's it's fine and it goes along and it does yeah. you know it does a thing in a similar way that market square heroes does a thing but yeah. um but it is a bit out of place yeah and it's a bit out of it's a bit out of context actually and and it's a bit out of place with what meridian does generally really we're not very good at that we're not right. very good at being a con a convincing rock band right right being unconvincing we're band. very good well we're very good at quirky stuff yeah yeah, yeah. and we can you know we can rock and we can be powerful but we're not very convincing at just being, you know. Some bands are just work, great, yeah. like you know, Foreigner and those sort of bands that can really rock. That's a, yeah. that's a it's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. It's a bit like reggae. Unless you're, unless you can do it, you can't do it. You know? yeah. Um, I'm interested in the track Berlin. It, to me, it sounds it's quite soundscapey, really. I'm just wondering. I don't know if you mm. can answer this question. Whether or not it's a kind of a veiled tribute to the sort of stuff Bowie, Bowie and Eno were doing in Berlin in the late seventies. Was that a kind of a hot nod to that? Or not? I guess, yeah. I mean, I guess yes. I mean, you know, we all we all love. You know, everybody loves Bowie. Yeah. You know, and him and Eno were, yeah, they were being very um, creative in those days. So mm. there's no inter. I don't think we've ever got any 
real intentions of doing <laughs> anything like that. We just do what we do. Yeah. Even if we wanted to, you know, we we wouldn't pull it off. It's like we have to just, we have this strange, we have this chemistry that we have that actually allows us to do what we do. And it's really hard to pin it down. Yeah. Which well, it, which is why it takes us so long to write music. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, sometimes you end up thinking, oh yeah, actually, yeah, that's quite, you know. So maybe subconsciously, there's a lot yeah. more going on than we maybe we think maybe. about. When you played the uh, Crooked Billet, um, you performed. Apparently, you performed under the name Low Fat Yogurts. Yes. Who, who came up with that name? Who's responsible for that one? Oh, that was um, that was one of those things. Like, um, sounds like a Hogarth moment. It might have been. It might have been a Hogarth moment, but you know, the, it was kind of in. It was one of those names that was kind of inspired by. Um, you know, Neil in the young ones with it, you know, he'd always he'd throw out odd names like Alternative Car Park was the yeah, a name of one of the weird bands that he apparently he was he was into at the time, you know, that was yeah. Um, and we just thought let's have a let's have a really odd name, you know. Yeah. Well why not? So, why not? And why not? And you of know. course it didn't fool anyone. Low fat yard might have stuck. people well the thing is I suppose people in the area know who's there, isn't it? You know. It's yeah. local knowledge. They don't yeah. need telephones and, you know, they don't need mobiles and things. They just know what's going on, don't they, instinctively. Yeah. Oh, that'll um, be that That'll be that be band in the big house then, recording an album. Yeah. <laughs> you know, news travels fast. And... Well, yeah, that was that was the first gig as well, wasn't it? With, uh, it Steve? was the very first, yeah. It was a, it was a bit it? of a, yeah, it was a bit of a good... It was a coup, really, in a way. It was a great thing to do because it allowed, it allowed sort of allowed us to introduce Steve. Yeah. To, yeah. in in a small, a small, insignificant way, I suppose, so that there was no pressure. Although, yeah. of course, there was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's always pressure. You know, they, they, yeah. there's never not pressure. But it wasn't like, you know, we're doing a sold out show somewhere. We were just doing a little pub. And yeah. if not, if fifty people turned up, that would be great. In actual fact, well, like five hundred people turned up, and it was <laughs> chaos. So, um, but that made that added to the fun in a way. I suppose it did. I suppose. It did. Yeah. I mean, the new album, uh, obviously, this album is kind of a new beginning for Marillion. I'm just wondering, you've got Hogarth's Easter makes the perfect contrast with Forgotten Sons, as they're both songs that deal with the troubles in Northern Ireland. Was that? Mm. Was that in your mind? Did that strike you at the time that there was a that was a possibility? Oh, I mean, I, I don't really think I considered it, but then I'm probably not the deep thinker in the band. <laughs> I mean, I you know, it's probably crossed my mind since, but at the time, um, I was more, I was more aware of the fact that it was a really good song. You know, it's a really nice song and yes. it would be a great thing to add to the album. And also introduce Steve and, and what Steve can do to the band as well. Because yeah. you know, um it was a <clears throat> it was it was a time where we were trying to get to know each other, you know. It's a bit like kids in the playground on the first day at school, you know, you're trying to work out who's you know who's who and, and, and how it's all going to work. And and so we were aware of a lot of the, um, a lot of the getting to know each other and, the, you know, all of that, the, 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 the kind of the dancing around various subjects of, yeah. oh, uh, well, we've already, you know, it's like he, you know, well, we've got a keyboard player, but now we've got another keyboard player who sings as well. So how's that going to work? And, you know, um, um, and and like well, we write songs, but then Steve writes songs as well. So how's that all going to happen? So it was quite nice that you know certain things could be introduced in a in a in a in a um in a cool way without good. without too much without too many issues and too many you know yeah situations arising. I mean, uh, Easter reached about 34 in the charts, UK charts, uninvited guests got to about 53. 
as a band, were you worried or were EMI more worried, do you think? Um, well, the charts are the charts, aren't they? I mean, they you know, um, they aren't as significant as you want them to be. I mean, even when they were significant, you know, you're in the charts. But next week, somebody else is in the charts. And, you know, all that all that stress and all that whatever it is that record companies, it's a bit like headmasters wanting everybody to pass their exams. And by the time, you know, two years later, who cares if, whether yeah. they've got their exams or not? Nobody cares because, yeah. you know, it's irrelevant by then. Yeah. Um, Rec the record companies were much i don't know I, it never bothered it never really bothered me it's nice to be in the charts obviously and when you're young you know when for the, the first period of the band having having a few chart successes is a good is a good way to introduce yourself to people but um i wasn't i was more concerned with um, are the fans you know do yeah. the fans like what we're doing is it viable and um i think it sold quite well and we had a we we, we did a good tour yeah we did a reasonable tour um we did a bigger tour for the second album actually yeah, um, yeah with yeah. steve but then that's probably i that's probably because the first album was good and and, and quite successful for us as, as as a way of introducing yeah chart yeah. positions we probably led with the wrong song really we led with hooks i think didn't we uh yes single? yeah i think it was it was yeah uh, I, and I, I think i haven't got the chart chart uh, number for that but... in hindsight in hindsight i think that was probably the wrong way to go about it maybe maybe i've got one last question for you one last question uh, it's a silly question as well. I sort of forewarn you. Oh, good. I like these. Okay. Well, Steve Hogarth said that uh, after How We Live split up, he was dead set on becoming a milkman. Knowing Steve the way you do, what sort of milkman would he have been? <laughs> wow. Now first then. frog milk milkman. Do you know what? I think at the time he would probably... Um, he probably, I would have, pro you'd have probably ended up going down the shops to buy your milk <laughs> if you wanted it before midday. These days, I think he'd be, much, he's, I think he'd be much better at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think that's probably the same. That's probably the case with all of us, actually. Yeah. I think be careful what got. you say because he might watch this video. Well, he probably will, won't he? <laughs> and um, as you say, it's a silly question, and uh, and uh, yeah, I've given you a silly answer, really. That's perfect answer. Perfect answer. Uh, Pete, I will repeat that this uh, deluxe edition of uh, Season's End is available from the 19th of May. There is a purchasing link just below this video. Yeah. Thank you it's... so much for your time. Sorry about the technical issues at the start of the interview. I know. I know. It's, I don't know. Oh, anyway, we got there. We I did. don't know whether we the did. link was corrupted in some way or whatever. Who knows? It Who knows? doesn't matter, does it? No one cares. No, no. And then you go, you can have a nice cup of tea. And uh, uh, when are we going? Oh, to... I'm on my first when... cup of coffee, actually. First cup of coffee. Yeah, okay. When are we going to get new music from Marillion? Tomorrow. Well, do you know what? What's interesting is that we do have some ah. stuff. We do have some stuff, and we always we we tend to say at the end of. Because we did at the end of the last album. Oh, you know, we've got quite a lot of ideas left over here. Right. And then, and then when, get, when we get round to thinking about a new album, um, we always want to do new stuff. It's yeah. always like, well, in the back of your mind, there's always like, well, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be a reason why that got left off, you know. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, and also, you know, you have to wait until the time's right. Uh, lyrically as well, because Steve writes all the lyrics, and there's a lot of that's that's a that's broad shoulders to you know I to take so. on because um, the the last two albums have had some brilliant lyrics on them. They have, yeah, I mean, super, yeah. super, super, super lyrics. Actually, um, I mean, he just he gets better, he gets better and better.
yeah. Steve, as, as I think, as a lyricist, there's some fantastic lyrics. I thought I thought Fear had some of the great best lyrics. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But but the new album as well. Amazing. So Steve Steve Hogarth, great lyricist. So really, so I mean, Melbourne. yeah, I think it. I mean, it's a very stressful time when somebody mentions a new album because oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know where to start, and it's you can't just scribble anything down on the back of a bag packet. Right. If you spoke, right. of course, which he right. doesn't. Know no. Why actually? I don't know why I mentioned a fag packet at all. Well, they used to say that, didn't they? Write it down on the back they of a fag packet. I don't know. Yeah. Who does smoke. or a beer, Matt? But then they don't drink either, so that's irrelevant. Oh, yeah. It's not very rock and roll, Pete. Not very rock and I'm roll. Not, I'm not very rock and roll. Okay. I was at one time, but we we don't we really shouldn't go there. Okay. Okay. You don't want to get sued or anything. Absolutely not. <laughs> Anyway, Pete, thank you so much for this interview. I will, uh, I will sign off now, and uh, yeah. you, you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank I you will do. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.